If you would like to support the podcast, you can click the Buy Us a Coffee link on our show notes or on our website. Your support helps us keep the podcast going, and we appreciate each of our listeners so much. You can also rate and review us on Apple and Spotify, follow us on social media, and don't forget to tell your friends and family about us. I'm Darlene. And I'm Melody. This is Hard Hard Times Times and and True Crimes. Crimes. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted above all my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises of the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in the smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversary. For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as a breath of violence... I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord because of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. This morning we're drinking caramel macchiatos. And where did you get these, darling? Food lion. <laughs> they came from a packet. All right, I'm going to try mine. Wow. That is delicious. Isn't it good? It is, so I have to ask because mm-hmm. it is so good. How much sugar is in this? Nine grams. Well, I didn't tell you before I came, but I'm doing a sugar detox this week. No. Yeah, you just totally messed that up. Well, I got the idea from, you know, I'm doing Weight Watchers. Mm-hmm. So this girl that I follow on YouTube, she has one of these every day for a treat. So I was like, I really got to try that. If there's a commercial for it and you can You're sell gonna it, I'm going to buy it. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. I'm the opposite of that. But this is a nice treat. I'm going to, yeah. um, I'll just start my sugar detox over tomorrow. I was only on day two. Okay, well. So I'll start over tomorrow. I'm, I'm so weak when it comes to <laughs> peer pressure. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to get into our story. In 1967, 32-year-old James Joseph Richardson and his wife, 29-year-old Annie May, lived in a two-bedroom apartment in South Central Florida in a town called Arcadia. James and Annie May had seven children who lived with them. Betty Jean was the oldest, and she was eight. Alice was seven. Susie was six. Doreen, five. Vanessa, four. Diane, three, and James Jr., two. Wow. And so seven children all under the age of eight, eight and under. Yes. They've been busy. They had been busy. 32 and 29. Wow. All the kids shared one room, and then James and Annie Mae were in the other room. Betty Jean, Susie, Doreen, and Vanessa were Annie Mae's daughters by her first husband, Leonard Bryant, who also happened to be James's stepbrother. Okay. So we have a blended family. Yes. And then Alice was James's daughter, and she had just moved in with the family a week earlier. 
And then Diane and James Jr. were James and Annie Mae's that they had together. Okay. So big family. Yeah. My parents only live about 20 minutes from Arcadia. So I grew up going there all the time. In fact, when I was just down there a couple months ago, I went to Arcadia. South Central Florida is the heart of the citrus industry. I think we've discussed that before on, on a different episode. On your uh, bloody Edgar Watson. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So James and Annie May were migrant workers who went out into the groves to pick oranges, tangerines, grapefruit during the fall and winter months. Fruit pickers like the Richardsons were paid bare minimum wages. And a lot of times they lived in these shoddy company quarters. Do you remember how we talked about sharecroppers getting into debt with their employers just to kind of get by and then getting stuck in that cycle of poverty? Yeah. Well, migrant workers often wound up in that same cycle of debt, having to live off credit from grocery stores and their bosses who charged them high interest rates. And most of the time, they didn't make enough to pay off the debt and not get back into debt. Right. It's so hard to break that cycle because Mm -hmm. you're barely making enough to cover each week. So if you're in debt for something else, piles up. Right. This was in 1967. Now, in the 1970s, things got a little bit better for migrants who worked for big citrus corporations like Minute Maid. Mm -hmm. They just put some policies in place that benefited their employees. Oh, Minute Maid. We should have had orange juice. Life wouldn't have been easy for the Richardsons. They had to work extremely hard for the little they had, and they worked long days. And even though it wouldn't seem like much to any of us today, or maybe even to many back then... The Richardsons were proud of the work that they did and the life they had together. When James and Annie Mae first started picking, their bosses would yell at them because they were so slow, (laughs) but they soon learned what they were doing, and in no time, they picked up their speed, and they earned 25 cents for each crate of oranges that they picked. On good weeks together, they could make about $120. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I think that was okay. 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It didn't go very far, though, because they had a big family and they helped out their neighbors whenever they could as well. Sometimes they would go down to the store and get 10 or $15 worth of groceries for their neighbor on credit. Oh, that was generous. Just the night before this tragedy that I'm going to talk about, Annie Mae had cooked a meal for a friend of theirs in the hospital and she and James took it to them. Good hearted people. Yeah. Now, wherever you saw James, Annie Mae wasn't too far behind. They were always together. If she went to the hospital, he went to the hospital. They worked together. They went to the store together. They did everything together. Wow. Sometimes that can be a bit much. It can. I think she might have always been worried that he might leave. Ah. Yeah. yeah. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I kind of think that might have been. Yeah. On the morning of October 25th in 1967, it was a typical Wednesday morning for the Richardson family. Annie Mae got out of bed before anybody else and started fixing lunch for her and James to carry to work. When she was finished, she started on the kids' lunch. She had made a big pot of rice and beans the night before, seasoned with hog jowl. That morning, she mixed grits in with it to make it go further. And then she put it back into the refrigerator. Now, she actually usually put a padlock on the refrigerator. What? One of their daughters, Doreen, had started getting in there and spilling stuff. And they probably didn't have food to spare like that. I don't know why I sounded so surprised. When my boys were little, we had a lock on the pantry. (laughs) Okay. That that was because, you know, they would go in there and get all the snacks and eat them. And then, of course, they didn't want to eat their real food. Right. So I'm like, well, yeah, stop this. And so we put a little lock on the pantry. And I kind of think that probably was part of the deal here. They might have been embarrassed to say that later, but probably they just didn't have enough food for the kids to get snacky. Maybe, yeah. So that morning she did not put a padlock on the door because their next door neighbor, Bessie Reese, was coming over to give the kids their lunch and to watch the little kids who couldn't go to school. And then told Bessie, you know, to lock it back up when she was through feeding the kids. Because she could just lock the padlock without the key. Next, she woke James up a little later than usual and told him he better hurry and get up Mm -hmm. because they were running late. Then she woke up their oldest daughter, Betty Jean, to help her get the rest of their kids their breakfast, which was a pot of grits, and to help get her school-age siblings dressed and ready for school. 
Betty Jean was her mama's little helper. Oh, I'm sure. Their next door neighbor, an older teenage girl named Dot, usually was the one that babysat the younger kids. But the night before, her mother, Bessie Reese, told the Richardsons that Dot had somewhere to be the next day and wouldn't be able to watch the kids. But she said she'd do it. Okay. James and Annie Mae agreed to pay Bessie and Dot $10 on Friday when they got paid for the week. The day before, they'd gone to the store to buy washing powders. And Annie Mae told Betty to make sure that she washed the dishes up after lunch. I'm sorry. You said washing powders. It's been a long time <laughs> since I've heard that. I know. It reminded me of my grandma. We always say laundry detergent now. Yep. But washing powders, yes. That was washing the 70s powders. and the 60s. Yeah. Yes, it was. Then Annie and James told the kids bye and they headed out for work. They walked about five or six blocks to get on a big covered truck that took them 16 miles out into a grove that they were working in that day. A few minutes later, Betty Jean, Alice, and Susie left for school, and Bessie Reese would watch the younger four kids. Although we don't know exactly what happened that day because she was never really questioned. Of course, I don't know what's going to happen yet, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm already wondering whatever it is, I would think that the babysitter would be questioned. You would think. Nothing that morning was out of the ordinary. At 11, the three older girls walked home from school for lunch. That was what they did back then. Right. Bessie Reese, the neighbor who was watching the younger kids, went into the fridge, took out the pot of beans, rice, and grits, and divided it into seven portions to feed the kids. After lunch, the oldest, Betty Jean, did what her mom told her to do, and she washed up all the dishes, and then she and her sisters walked back to school. Within just a few minutes, each of the three girls became deathly ill. Mm. They were convulsing. They were foaming at the mouth. Oh, man. Alice's teacher thought she was having a seizure. Mm -hmm. Her hands were like gripping onto her desk. Her mouth was contorting. Mm, wow. I mean, it was scary. So they got them down to the nurse's office and immediately the principal, Mr. Lewis Anderson, knew something bad was happening. And he had some teachers help him get the girls into his vehicle and rush the girls to the hospital. Betty Jean was the only one of the three girls that was able to speak at that point. Wow. She said, I'm all right. She did? Yeah. And then the principal said, well, sure you are, Betty Jean, trying to assure her. Oh, they had no sooner left the school to head for the hospital when Bessie Reese called the school, telling the secretary that they needed to send Betty Jean back home. The four younger kids were acting up and she needed help tending to them. Mm, that's suspicious. Yeah. The secretary told her that the girls were seriously ill and that there were teachers on their way to the apartment now to see about the younger kids. When they got there, Bessie was sitting on the porch holding little James Jr., who was already nearly dead. Oh, my goodness. Vanessa and Diane were out in the yard screaming in pain and convulsing. Oh, that is so sad. And Doreen was inside the apartment laying in the floor, and she was also convulsing. And she was hiding behind a door. Oh, and, and what's Bessie doing during all this time? Sitting on the porch. Just sitting on the porch. Holding the baby. I have so many questions right now, but I mean, like, I know you're going to answer them. So right. I'm, I'm going to hold them and wait and see what you say. But I mean, like, I've got a ton of questions in my brain. Yeah, it's it's strange, right? Mm -hmm. The teachers then rushed all four of the little kids to the hospital. Meanwhile, James and Annie May had just sat down in the grove to eat their lunch when a man, one of the farmhands, came running out to him to tell him that one of their kids were sick and had to be rushed to the hospital and that one of them needed to go be with them. They were worried because they assumed that it had been little James Jr. He'd been sickly just about ever since he had been born. Mm. He kind of had like a failure to thrive thing where yeah. he didn't put on weight very well and just, you know, just stayed sickly. Mm -hmm. They both wanted to be with their son. And again, where one went, the other one went. Right. And that was their shared son. That was their the shared son. That was the baby, the two-year-old. Yeah. Anyway, the rancher offered to give the couple a ride back to the hospital. Meanwhile, at the hospital, doctors were doing everything they could for the children. All seven of the kids were foaming at the mouth, convulsing, and it was clear that their lungs were filling up with fluid. They were drowning on their own fluids. Oh, that is tragic. Doctors and nurses were frantically trying to save their lives, using tongue depressors to try and remove the foam from oh. their airways. 
It was a, a madhouse, as you can imagine. You know, doctors running around to seven different children. Right, all seven of them. DeSoto is not a great big county. It's a small farming community. Yeah. Investigators realized pretty quick that this had to be a case of poisoning. But how and where had it come from? The press, of course, they found out about things really quick. Mm -hmm. And they were worried that it had been a case of a cafeteria poisoning or something. Right. But then they realized it didn't happen. At school, all the girls were sisters and they had eaten lunch at their house. Right. And Mm -hmm. is there a chance? I mean, obviously, it's food poisoning. But is there a chance it could be natural food poisoning? Like maybe that food had gone bad? The only I don't thing think that makes that me ever... think no is because, like, that foaming in the mouth. Yeah. Could it have just been... An accident? Like, she made that food the night before, and it was something... There was something bad in it? It's definitely not... I don't think they ever thought it was food poisoning. Okay. So I'll just say that. Two different law enforcement agencies had jurisdiction over this case. So there was the Arcadia Police Department, and then there was the DeSoto County Sheriff's Department. Okay. Officer John Minoan with the Arcadia PD wanted to do something. He had been hanging out at the hospital watching these kids suffer, suffer and he felt helpless. So he decided to leave and go to the Richardson's apartment to see if he could find the source of whatever poison these kids have got, had got into. Well, that was good thinking. It was. When Officer Minoan got to the apartment, even before he walked in, there was an odor so strong that he had to cover his nose. Well, okay, now that's interesting. Yeah. What, like, okay, so an odor of what? Now he said what a penny would taste like times a thousand. So like that coppery yeah. metal. Mm-hmm. And you hear people describe it different ways throughout okay. this. But yeah, that's how he described it. As Officer Minoan walked inside the apartment, the smell was overwhelming. He searched all over the apartment and the shed for the poison, but was unable to find it anywhere. By the time he got back to the hospital, eight-year-old Betty, Alice, who was seven, six-year-old Susie, five-year-old Doreen, four-year-old Vanessa, and two-year-old James Jr. had already died. Oh, my gracious. That is so tragic. Ugh. Three-year-old Diane was the only Richardson child still clinging to life, and they knew that she was not going to live long. Not going to make it. Ugh. Uh-huh. Gracious. When the children's parents, James and Annie Mae, got to the hospital, the first person they saw standing outside was their neighbor and the kid's babysitter, Bessie. James asked her, what was going on? She told him she didn't know that to go on in the hospital and the doctors would tell him. James later said he still thought that it was probably James Jr. And she was just saying, I don't know what's wrong with him. But okay. the doctors, they'll, they'll explain it. So he didn't know it was all of his no, children. No, he still had, they had no idea. And there was no indication from anybody that they had been with that they knew that it was all of their kids. So they're getting ready to find out the worst thing in their whole lives. When he and Annie Mae walked inside the hospital, they were met by a minister who took them to the chapel and said that they all needed to get on their knees and pray. Oh. Pray for what? James and Annie were asking. But nobody was telling him anything. They they, were asking him questions like, do you have insurance? But I think everybody was so frantic with the kids, mm -hmm. too. It was chaotic. And at this point, if they're thinking it's just one of their kids, their heart's sinking because they're thinking, oh, we're going to lose a child. But they, they still have no clue that it's all the kids. Right. Wow. Finally, the DeSoto County Sheriff Frank Klein came into the room. He looked at James and said, boy... All your children are dead. Just like that? Just like that. Wow. Man. Annie Mae fell to her knees screaming and crying to the point that she had to be sedated, of course. Right. I mean, all of her kids. Right. James had a different reaction. Some reports say he looked at the sheriff and said, you're a liar. I mean, I can see that. You're just in such disbelief. Yes, I can see that too, because I actually have gotten some news before Mm -hmm. that was devastating. And the first words out of my mouth was, you better be lying. Right, right. But I don't think that sat well with Sheriff Klein. And then he wasn't crying. I think he couldn't process it. Shock will do some crazy things to you. I remember my, my mom, my dad's mom telling me about when she found out that her oldest son, who had just turned 18, had been killed in a car accident. Mm. She could not even cry. 
because she was, she was just in, in shock. shock. Now, you know, eventually when they came, you know, it took a long time for them to stop. But it is really important not to judge people on their reactions to traumatic news like this. Yeah. And I still I mean, I will admit I still do that. Yeah. But I think here in these cases over and over and over again, it's teaching me. I think so, too. I think so, too. I'm, I'm noticed that now I'm, I'm less quick right. to jump to that assumption like, oh, you're not crying. Right. Despite the fact that these parents were just given the worst possible news that any parent could ever receive. Time seven, Sheriff Klein was so unsympathetic to them. Well, even the way he delivered the news was very cold, I think. He was very cold toward them. So it makes you think he must already be suspecting them. Yeah, from the very beginning. He started questioning them right away. Now, mind you, Annie May can barely speak. She's been sedated. Of course, yeah. At first, they started grilling her, asking her, you know, is there any poison in your house? And she said no. She kept saying no over and over again. I don't know. I don't know what poisoned the, the kids. And then finally, she said, okay, there might be some rat poison. And he asked her where, and she said, in the refrigerator. Wait, what? Uh-oh. Yeah. But they didn't. I don't think they found any okay. in the refrigerator. And I don't know if she just said that because they were not going to stop until she told yeah, them. Sometimes. I'm not sure. Who would keep that in the refrigerator? Do, is, that what, is that what she did? Like, I don't know. It did make me think, well, maybe that's why they locked the refrigerator. Oh, you yeah. Know? Yeah, maybe. And I also wonder, were they suggesting to her? Right. Do you keep it in the refrigerator? Not where you keep it, but do yeah. you keep it in the refrigerator? And if she's sedated and also in shock, maybe going to say whatever they've already suggested to her. Right. I don't know. I mean, you know, my mind's all over the place with it right now. But yeah. So then the sheriff had James give him a full account of everything that had happened the day before. So he said they cleaned the house. They went to the store together. That's when they got those washing powders. Annie Mae had cooked a meal for a friend of theirs who was in the hospital she and James had taken it to him and visited with him for a while. They came back home and James was watching TV when an insurance salesman by the name of George Purvis came over. But James told him he didn't have any money. He's like, I can't, you know, I can't. And he said, well, hey, why don't you borrow it from your neighbors? And he's like, I'm not worrying them about money for an insurance policy. Well, he was like, well, do you want insurance? And James was like, yeah, I do. I had it on my wife and kids, but I let the policy lapse. And so, I, again, I can't afford it. Mr. Purvis said, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I can pretty much like draw it up for you, but I can come back and get the premium. It's not going to be effective until it's paid for. So I'll come back Tuesday, right? James said during this time, the neighbor, Bessie, kept running back and forth between their apartment and hers. Mr. Purvis, I don't know if he wrote it up because I've heard two different things. One thing I've heard says that he wrote it up. And then the other thing I've heard was that basically he just left a business card, kind of their like little agreement. Right. Then Purvis left and told him that, look, it's no good until the premium's paid, but I'll be back to get the money next Tuesday. And he left. After that, Bessie came back over to tell them her daughter couldn't watch the kids that next day, but that she could do it. Remember, we mm -hmm. had talked about that. Then James and Annie Mae went to bed. It was close to midnight, and they talked about Christmas that night. They already had some stuff on layaway for the kids and were getting excited. That was it until the next morning. As far as Sheriff Klein was concerned, though, James had just provided the motive. He was convinced that James believed the kids were insured, and he set out to find the evidence to prove that. And that's what I was thinking. It already sounds like that's what he's made his mind up about. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to come at it from that angle. Right. The Arcadia PD had been to the apartment, but now Frank Klein and the DeSoto County Sheriff's Department, they tore that apartment up looking for evidence, looking for the poison, anything that they could. Yeah. And they actually ended up confiscating 59 items of evidence. Hmm including the papers from the insurance agent that James had left on the TV. Also, out of those items, 22 ended up having traces of that poison. The lunch pot, the plates, the utensils that the kids ate from, the breakfast dishes, the sugar, the flour, the washing powders, a sweater, a rag, a windbreaker, and a hard hat. 
That is very strange. A whole city could have been poisoned to death with the amount of poison found in that apartment. Wow. This is kind of out there, but is there any chance that the washing powders could have, like when she added the grits Mm -hmm. to the pot of beans and rice, could she have mistakenly added the washing powders and maybe they've got, I don't know. That's a good theory, but it's not. That's not it? it. No. They did find all this evidence, but despite their best efforts, they could not find the poison itself. Okay, so they found the evidence of the poison, but they didn't yes. find they the poison. They could not find, and they looked everywhere. They looked in the shed everywhere. They tore that apart, looked all over the apartment, tore that apart. So the press, of course, was already running wild with this story. They came to the hospital to question James Richardson, asking what happened to his children. He told the reporters, I have no idea, but the sheriff had better find out because it's his job. Oh, man. And Sheriff Klein, as you can imagine, did not appreciate that. You have to remember, this was the South. I'm not saying that this case was racially motivated, but I think it did play a part in the way that he was treated. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it because he was a migrant worker? He and his family were black. Okay. And And so maybe they were more suspicious of them. I think they believed that he was guilty. Mm -hmm. But I think the way he was treated, like okay, the way he I went in there and saying. said, boy, your yes. all your kids are dead. Yes. He ran for sheriff. He had some very interesting views about black people, about how they weren't as smart as white people. Yeah. Like had their a brains bearing were smaller. on, the, on how did. he uh, treated them. Yes. And, okay. I got you. Now, what about the babysitter? Was she black too? She was. Okay. And he protected her. It's crazy. You can tell my mind keeps going to her. Like, yeah. Uh, it is weird. <clears throat> when James and Annie Mae were allowed to go back home from the hospital, the police drove them. When they were walking up to the house, as they got closer, James said, what is that smell? To him, it smelled like, you know how a gas stove will have mm-hmm. a really strong yes. odor? Well, he said, that's what it smelled like. The Arcadia PD right. did ask Bessie, and she said, I, d- I didn't smell anything. Oh. Yeah, say, she um... said she smelled nothing. So anyway, when they got in the door, it was like an almost overwhelming smell. The police officers went inside and James helped put Annie Mae to bed. She just was like in a trance almost, either from shock or from the sedatives and probably both. Both. I mean, she's probably a basket case. I'm sure. The next day, a neighbor, Charlie Smith, was asked by Betty Reese to go with her into the Richardson shed to see if they could find the poison. Lo and behold, even though two law enforcement agencies had searched high and low, Charlie, helped by Bessie Reese, found the bag of poison almost in plain sight. Hmm. All right. You know, I I already think she had to be the one that did it. Like, I'm convinced. It's interesting because the bag of poison was dry, even though everything else was wet with dew. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's because she planted it in there. It was very suspicious, but not to Sheriff Klein. You're kidding. He was convinced that James was the one that put it there, that he needed to get rid of it. And so he put it out there overnight. But where would he have hid it? In the meantime, it was not like he could put it in his pocket. Yeah. And that was the evidence he was looking for to to Mm -hmm. point to James. Absolutely. The poison was called parathion. And it was a deadly insecticide. And it was used in orange groves. Mm -hmm. When it was ingested, it causes its victims to die excruciating deaths. Oh, that is so sad. Just thinking about those kids suffering. Yeah. Remember, uh, I think it was your second episode that you did about Aunt Earl Dennison and those little girls. Yes. And just how they suffered. Oh, I'm just, that just breaks my heart. The same with all seven of these babies. Mm Mm-hmm. And with that amount of poison, they didn't have a chance. Right. The community, teachers, administrators, churches all rallied together, and they raised enough money to have a funeral for all seven children. Oh, that's sweet that their community rallied around them. Yeah. Their service was held at the Smith Brown High School Gymnasium, and it was beautiful and terrible. More than a thousand black and white mourners sat side by side. Seven little white satin covered coffins lined up in the center of the gym floor. 
the children were dressed like they were going to a wedding. The little girls had on these beautiful white dresses with white gloves and white flowers laid all around them. Little James in his Sunday suit. A Baptist preacher named C.S. Felder, who preached the funeral, said that the children would never have to walk in despair, would never experience anger or sin. He spoke about the Shulamite woman whose only son had died, and although she'd asked for a miracle, before it had happened, she declared it as well. Another local reverend read the 27th Psalm. Prophetic in a way. Okay. Yeah. The girl's principal got up and spoke about them and how they would be missed by all of their friends at school. One of their friends, an 11-year-old little girl, sang, It is well with my soul. Oh, that's my favorite hymn. Yeah, mine too. My mom said she wants that played at her funeral. I do too. Yep. Cries echoed throughout the gym from Annie Mae and James during the service. Oh, and then when she, Oh, I know. And of course, when she and James would cry out, the crowd would follow. Mm-hmm. Everyone felt sick with sympathy for the poor souls whose world had just fallen apart and for those little innocent babies who died such painful, terrible deaths. It took over 45 minutes for the crowd to pass by and to pay their last respects. Annie Mae collapsed when she got up to see her kids and had to be revived with smelling salts. She was taken to the hospital before she could go to the graveside. She had to be sedated again. Yeah. And then she went on to the the graveside where she and James would say their final goodbyes. Mm. The next day, Sheriff Frank Klein arrested James and charged him with first degree murder. Oh, wow. But not having any evidence, the charges were downgraded to child neglect and they arrested Annie Mae as well. Oh, wow. We all know the power of the media, yeah, right? This, to me, is a powerful lesson. When we hear a story, we believe it, Mm -hmm. unless it's about our favorite politician. I think how many people are tried by media. I know. And we and I'm guilty of yeah. and like, we're, we we see in that more and more with our episodes. Almost yeah. every one that we do, we're seeing how much the media plays into it. Yes. Klein and Judge Hayes held a press conference telling the media that James was the prime suspect and that life insurance was the motive. He said that James Richardson wanted to get rid of his family. He said that Annie May had pressed charges on James for abandonment before, and she had, and that he had threatened to leave her, and that she had threatened to press those charges on him again. Klein also told the press that James had as many as 20 children, or like 22 children, I think, and that five of them, besides these seven, had died under suspicious circumstances. Oh, okay. And that's true. That's that's a fact. Because I'm thinking, um, well, now I'm starting to second Wonder. guess. Yeah. James's bond was set at $500, but Judge Hayes told reporters that even if somebody were to pay his bond, they would not let him go. Mm. Oh, they can do that? I d- didn't think so. But okay. this is Apparently in Arcadia, Florida yeah, in the 60s. It was later determined that Sheriff Klein either outright lied about the number of kids James had, or he exaggerated that. Skewed those numbers a little bit there. He did have three other children die. That was true. But he had nothing to do with any of them. And how are they sure of that? I have to wait till the end. Oh, okay. But he didn't have anything to do with those deaths. Medical issues, and then some he hadn't even been there. When they like he wasn't even in the vicinity and couldn't have had anything to do with it. Even when Sheriff Klein knew the truth, though, he never cleared any of that up with the media and, in fact, continued to do everything he could to mar James's reputation. Oh, I hate that. Judge Hayes even came out and said that the Richardsons had been given polygraphs and failed. Okay, this is why, regardless of how innocent I am, I will never take a polygraph test. Ever yeah, to prove me my either. innocence. Me either. Because if the police believe you're guilty, then they'll ignore and downplay a past polygraph. But if you fail, they're going to blast it all over every news outlet that they can get to cover it. Exactly. There's a reason that they're not allowed to be used as evidence in the court of law. They're only accurate about 60 to 70 percent of the time. And we've seen that over and over in yes. some of the ones that we've already covered. We have. 
civil attorney Mark Lane and defense attorney John Robinson, they were watching all of this coverage on the news because, I mean, it was everywhere, especially all over Florida. They knew that there was no way this guy was getting a fair trial. Right. Whether he's guilty or not. Exactly. Yeah. But they were just seeing it and like, oh, my gosh, this guy hasn't even been convicted yet. And and he's already considered guilty. Yeah. yeah. John Robinson actually contacted the NAACP on James's behalf and asked them if they would advocate for him. They gave him a list of attorneys and he picked actually John Robinson because he said his name was close to his. <laughs> Picking by the name. Every time we do the Kentucky Derby, I always pick horses based on their name. And then they always really? lose. I never win. So that I'm is like, probably sweet. not a good method to pick your attorney. To pick either. your attorney, right. Okay, so remember that two separate departments were involved in the case. Yeah. Sheriff Klein is with the DeSoto County Sheriff Department. And he and his department are convinced that James is guilty, right? But the Arcadia PD wasn't so sure. They had found out that the neighbor, Bessie Reese, was actually on parole for shooting and killing her second husband. Oh, was she now? She was actually sentenced to 20 years, but only served three. And she was strongly suspected of poisoning her first husband, Oh, (sighs) who suddenly dropped dead after Bessie fed him a meal of beef stew. Mm Mm-hmm. As for a motive, see, the Richardsons, Bessie and her third husband had all been good friends, right? They shared meals together. They hung out regularly. Bessie would help them with the kids. But then Bessie's husband went to Orlando with James one weekend to see James's family. He ended up taking a liking to James's cousin and didn't come back home to Bessie. Oh, the plot thickens. She was furious and blamed James. Okay. She wouldn't talk to him or any May. So uh, you're painting a motive here. Mm-hmm. Her daughter started watching the kids for money and Bessie let her because without her husband there, money was tight. Mm-hmm. But she wanted nothing to do with the Richardsons. She was ticked. And they did feel bad for her. Mm -hmm. And they would actually get her groceries from time to time. I mean, they'd give them to the daughter Mm -hmm. because the daughter babysat. But they respected her wanting to keep her distance, right? But when she came over that Tuesday night before the kids died, James and Annie Mae figured it was all over and everything was going back to normal. Right. Now, the Arcadia PD was wondering if she might have had something to do with what happened to the kids. To add to their suspicion... They found the matching glove of the one that they knew was used to disperse the poison Oh, in her apartment. Oh. Not to mention that she just happened to be there and point out the poison to Charlie Smith when it was found. Technically, she found it. She just gave him the credit for it. Of course. Yes. She also initially lied to the police and told them she hadn't been in Richardson's apartment at all that morning. Okay, that's weird. Yeah. But then she changed her story and said, okay, well, I went in, but I just went in to divide up the food Mm -hmm. and I gave them the food and they all fed themselves. I was thinking, okay, so the two-year-old fed himself? Right, exactly. Yeah, her story does not add up. Right. At all. The two-year-old fed himself rice and beans and grits. The Arcadia PD called Frank Klein and they told him everything that they had found out. But he was not interested in even considering Bessie Reese as a possible suspect. Now, that doesn't that make you mad? Yeah, he would. I mean, he, that he wouldn't even look at somebody else who's obviously suspect here. Right. When the DA and the assistant DA told Sheriff Klein that he didn't have enough evidence to charge James with murder, he pulled three jailhouse informants out of the woodworks. So he was determined to get his man. Yeah. Now, they all had way different versions of what James had supposedly told of course. told them in the beginning. Mm-hmm. But eventually, they polished up their stories and they became more... At first, they were like all so different. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, you know, they got them polished up. With that, James Richardson was charged with the first degree murder of the oldest daughter, Betty Jean. They only charged him with her murder in case he wasn't convicted, and that way they could retry him 
with one of the other children and they were prepared to do that again and again as many times as it took to get a conviction. Yeah, that's the same thing that happened with Velma Barfield. Remember, they only yes. charged her with the one because if they didn't win that one, they could go back and charge her with the others. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a good strategy and a good ploy if somebody's guilty. Yeah. But if they're not guilty, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like if you're just doing it to make sure you can get a conviction, whether they're guilty or not. Right. There just wasn't really a shred of evidence. Right. I mean, honestly, they had more physical evidence to charge his wife Mm -hmm. than him. Because she She had had handled the food. They knew that. And so had Bessie Reese. He had not. The trial was just a formality, though, because the media had already convicted him. Okay. So they had to. The informants told authorities James had confessed to poisoning his kids At the trial, two of the informants said James told them he put parathion in the food. One said that he was mad because his wife was having a lesbian affair with Reese, the next door babysitter, which was never even. Okay. And I actually was going to ask earlier, was there any chance that Betty Reese and uh, James could have been having an affair? Maybe they did this together. No, No. I don't know. The other informant had been shot to death before the trial, but somehow they still allowed a statement to be read by what he supposedly said. Wow. Talk about loopholes. Exactly. Wouldn't that be considered hearsay? If he, yeah, like, if of it course was just it a, would. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and within a week of all the jailhouse informants given these testimonies, they were out of jail and their charges were dropped. Well, isn't that convenient? Mm hmm. But Sheriff Klein arrested Bessie Reese and George Smith and put them in jail as material witnesses. Huh? Yes. Wait a minute. He arrested them Mm -hmm. and put them in jail Uh as witnesses? Yes. Yeah. Can you do that? He did. I didn't think so, but that's what he did. This is a bizarre case. Yes. I didn't even think that was a thing. I never knew. I guess in the 60s, they did what they wanted to do. I read in the newspaper, remember I had said earlier that the judge said, even if he makes bail, we're not letting him go. Right. I mean, they did things their way. In the trial, even though John Robinson tried to have the trial moved, it was denied. Sheriff Klein kept making inflammatory statements about James's other children dying under suspicious circumstances, which he knew by this time that James had nothing to do. With those, with, deaths. with those deaths. He also said that he had a receipt proving that James had bought insurance, but he never produced the receipt, nor did he call the insurance man Purvis to testify because Purvis had already explained over and over again that he had not sold James a policy. He said that James knew the policy was no good until it was paid for. He made that clear, but Sheriff Klein decided that Purvis knew he'd get fired if he admitted the truth, which he believed Purvis told James he would go ahead and cover him for the premium until Tuesday. And so anything that Sheriff Klein just decides Mm -hmm. is the truth, he can just put out there. And I'm sure he's putting this out to the media. Oh, yeah, he is. And Klein said insurance salesmen did that all the time. And that was just something that they did in order to make sales. So it was illegal. And that's why he believed Purvis couldn't admit to it. So he just didn't call him. The prosecution also didn't call Bessie Reese, who was literally the last person Mm -hmm. well, to feed the kids. So they knew she definitely fed them the poison in their last meal. And they didn't call George Smith, who found the poison. So they didn't call her? Nope. But she was put in jail. Yep. They didn't end up calling her. Oh, that is definitely fishy. So Uh I wonder why they did that. Were they trying to keep the defense from being able to? Maybe. I don't know. I got to think I read statements from her. So if you have any questions, ask me because I may know. Okay. The defense called 13 witnesses. They called Annie May. She told how much James loved the kids how he worked hard to provide for them, how he never mistreated them, much less would he murder them. You know, she was absolutely convinced that he had nothing to do with it. His stepmother was Annie May's kid's grandmother. All right, wait a minute. Okay. So remember his stepbrother. Oh, yeah. 
fathered Annie May's other kids. Oh, that's right. You remember yes, that? Yes, yes. So she was very much intertwined in the family. And those were her grandkids. You know, those were her, not yeah. her real son's children. And she said that she knew. And she believed that James, She absolutely innocence. believed that he had nothing to do with it. She said he loved those kids. Okay. And she was, she was not his mother. She was his she stepmother. Was, yes. So, okay. So she doesn't have any reason to no reason cover to, up for him. Absolutely not. They also called cellmates and other inmates that had been serving time with James who said that he never had confessed to anything as long as they had known him. And most of his time in jail was spent crying over the loss of his children. Mm. You think about it. He didn't really even get to grieve. No. He started having to defend himself right away. Yeah. But after a 30 minute deliberation, James Richardson was found guilty by an all white jury, some of who had been KKK members in the past. And like, again, I'm not saying that this case was racially motivated, but I believe James's race affected the way he was treated. Wow. He was sentenced to death. What? Yes. Oh, man. Now, a civil attorney named Mark Lane followed James's case in the media mm -hmm. and he strongly believed he was innocent. He met with James and his attorney, John Robinson, and promised them that day that he would not give up until James was a free man. He started the Free James Richardson campaign. And in 1970, Lane wrote a book called Arcadia that I actually read to learn about this case. The prosecutor in the case supposedly got drunk <laughs> and admitted to falsifying evidence in the Richardson case to have him put away. Wow. His secretary was horrified and told her boyfriend about the statements that her boss had made. So her boyfriend broke into the <laughs> prosecutor's office and stole James Richardson's case file. Wow. That is crazy. <laughs> He then contacted John Robinson, which was James's attorney, right? But Robinson thought it was a hoax and he ignored him. <laughs> this gets more and more unbelievable. Yeah. In 1972, the Supreme Court abolished the death penalty and James's sentence was reduced to 25 years. Thankfully, I believe that was a God thing. Yeah. And I believe in the death penalty, but I'm glad for his sake. In 1988, the only jailhouse informant who was still alive recanted his statements about James. He said that he was persuaded and bribed by Sheriff Frank Klein and the district attorney. Oh, and then Mark Lane got those stolen files. Yeah. So he got a hold of them. Oh. They found out that the defense had not been made aware of very important information in the case. And, you know, that's not, yeah, that's not allowed. In discovery, you're supposed to put it all out there. Exactly. For instance, the prosecution had a report by the Duval County PD stating that James Richardson had nothing to do with the deaths of his other children. And yet they kept insinuating that he had murdered them. I mean, he was, they convinced the jury wow. that he had probably murdered them. There were several other things like this in the case files. Then, so there is a nursing home out in the country, Rest Haven. This is in Hardy County where my mom and dad, mm -hmm. you know, live. My Papa Bart actually was out there. He went there in his old age. So Bessie Reese was sent there because she had Alzheimer's disease. When she was being treated, her nurses swore in a statement that she had confessed over a hundred times to murdering those children. Uh, she made several, I mean, several statements. And to me, that's very telling. Once they don't know what they're saying, yep. whatever comes out is usually, and again, I'm no professional on Alzheimer's, but right. just from the limited experience I have, is from some faraway memory. It's something yeah. that's, Got an element of truth. That's probably bothering her. And she said this over and over and over and over again. Well, when they told this to Frank Klein, he said, yeah, so what? She said that over and over throughout the years because she was the one who fed him that day. She wasn't saying that she actually put the poison in their food. She was saying she feels bad that she fed him the food that killed them. He just truly, he was not interested in getting the right person. He, no. he already had his mind he made up. He totally believed that wow. um, James Richardson was the murderer. It seemed as though Klein was protecting Bessie Reese, but it didn't make any sense. 
But then it was uncovered that Bessie Reese's daughter, Sarah Black, had requested an order for Frank Klein to take a paternity test. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. Meaning. Well, now, yeah. Go ahead. That he was most likely the father or the potential father of Bessie Reese's grandchild. In fact, the grandchild later also submitted a request from Frank Klein for paternity. Now, the results were never made public. The story, <gasps> I'm sorry, the, the mm -hmm. picture just became very, very clear. Now, it being the 60s in the South, he was probably worried that would damage his reputation. And so he wanted to protect her so that she would protect him. Oh, yeah. He didn't want that to come out. No. Lane turned all of this over to the governor of Florida, who turned everything over to Dade County investigators so that they could do an independent investigation, mm -hmm. like outside of Arcadia mm -hmm. and DeSoto County. So Janet Reno, oh, she was the one who did the investigation, and she uncovered six different Brady violations. Do you know what that means? Um, no, but I'm assuming it's something that he did against the law in his investigation. Yeah, it's when they withhold evidence that the other side should be privy to. Okay. And she also suspected a cover-up from the sheriff, the prosecutor, and the district attorney. However, they were never charged with anything and were cleared of all wrongdoing. Mm -mm -mm. On October 25th in 1988, 20 years to the day of the murders, it was decided that James would get a new trial. But then Florida decided not to retry him for the murders. And on May 5th in 1989, Reno announced the dismissal of the case and Richard was finally released from prison. He made the statement, like the man said, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I am free at last. He served 21 years in prison, more than half of his adult life. James was released at 53 years old, and when Annie May was 51, she had supported James the whole time, moving close to whatever prison he was transferred to all over the state of Florida. Richardson filed a wrongful conviction lawsuit against DeSoto County that was settled for $150,000, which that is nothing. That doesn't sound like much. It's not. But in June 2014... Florida Governor Rick Scott signed a bill authorizing payment of more than $1 million to Richardson. Bessie Reese has since been named the key suspect in the murders, but she died in 1992 and never faced any charges. Sheriff Klein lost two elections in the 1980s and retired to Port Charlotte, where he died in October of 2013. A documentary was made about Richardson called Time Simply Passes. You can watch it for free on YouTube. I watched it. It was really good. Sadly, this is so sad to me. James and Annie Mae ended up splitting up. No. I know. After all that she waited? After all, that all Yes, after all that. Richardson, 81, lives somewhere in Kansas with his new wife, Teresa. He didn't want people to know his exact location because he said he worried if people found out he had money, they might rob him. He had open heart surgery in 1987, which he would have never been able to have had had he been in prison. His life was saved by getting out and then having the money yeah. to be able to get the surgery. Was Richardson innocent or was he guilty? Was Bessie Reese actually confessing or was she expressing guilt over being the one who physically fed the kids? What do you think? Well, from the middle of this episode, I've been thinking it was her. Yeah, I really do, too. When you told how, like, her daughter normally kept the kids, mm -hmm. and then she went over to keep the kids, then you told the twist about how she was angry because her husband had gone off with James and not coming back. Right. Just too many other things. But really, the, the physical evidence is that poison that showed up. It was nowhere to be found. Right. And then it showed up in their building out back the next day. She happened to be the one to find it. And the glove. Oh, yeah, that glove. That That's was right. found in her house. It is absolutely insane that she was never investigated. It is a shame. And they're not really even questioned. No, not by DeSoto County. Like, and I guess they were probably bigger than the police department. 
Well, yeah, I'm assuming you know? because it's yeah, the county is like a bigger area, and right. Yeah. That is just crazy. But I'm so thankful that he wound up getting out. I'm so thankful that he got compensation. But his life, yeah, he was young. He was 32 years old. Mm-hmm. He could have had children. He there were so many things he could have done. Yeah, that he never got the chance to do because of being wrongfully convicted. Of- yeah, and the, and then on top of that, the saddest part, he never got to see his children grow up because right. they were taken from him. Right. Like so I do think she did it and I think she's pure evil. Yeah. Not only all that evidence, but she had done these things before. Right. She was a known murderer and had poisoned she had a violent streak and had poisoned one of her husbands, right? It was strongly suspected. In fact, they wanted to exhume his body, but Frank Klein was like, absolutely not. He didn't think it was necessary, no. did he? He said they were just picking on an old woman. Yeah. yeah. An old woman that's probably the grandmother of his love child. Exactly. Isn't that the strangest twist? Yeah, I was. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> but at the same time, even though I didn't see it coming, I wasn't shocked by it. I mean, I kind of was, but then at the same time, in the back of my mind, I was thinking... Of course that's the case. Right. Of course you're covering right. that up for yourself. And that, that makes everything else look very clear now. Of course. So those sure were some hard times. Those were some hard times. Originally, when I recorded Psalm 27, I was going to sound like an old-time Southern Baptist preacher. But when my wife heard me recording, she opened the door and said, Quit being stupid and do it right. And I told her, I'll do it however I want to. It just so happened, I want to do it a different way. If you want to guarantee that your spouse knows that you're going to do exactly what you want to do, you make sure you tell everybody you know, and a few people you don't, to check out Hard Times and True Crimes. Till next time, goodbye. Goodbye.